This is the anecdote or episode campaign that failed from Clay Shannon's performance, The Adventures of Mark Twain, as told by himself. Missouri was a slave state, but it never seceded from the Union. That being so, the soldiers stationed in Hannibal, and there were many, were Union soldiers, and I had to keep away from them and out of sight if I did not want to be pressed into service as a pilot on a warship, where I would be a target to get shot at by soldiers and snipers on the riverbanks. Not that I would have minded that so much, but I would rather volunteer than be drafted in a hadn't quite yet made up my mind which side I preferred to die for. Eventually, I did make a choice, and in the earliest summer days of the war, I slipped out of Hannibal one night with a friend to join an army detachment nearby. I was made second lieutenant of a company of eleven men who knew nothing about war. My friend Ben Tupper, who was 19 years old, 6 feet high, 3 feet wide, and some distance through, and just out of the infant school, was made orderly sergeant. He had a hard time. When he was mounted and on the march, he used to go to sleep, and his horse would reach around and bite him on the leg, and then he would wake up and cry and curse and want to go home. He was town-bred and did not seem to have any correct idea of military discipline. If I commanded him to shut up, he would say, Who was your slave last year? One evening, I ordered him to ride out about three miles on picket duty to the beginning of a prairie. He said, What? In the night? And them blamed Union soldiers likely to be prowling around there any time? So he wouldn't go. And the next morning I ordered him again. He said, In the rain? He didn't go. Next day I ordered him on picket duty once more. This time he looked hurt. He said, What on Sunday? You must be a darn fool. Well, picking it might have been a very good thing, but I saw it was impracticable, so I dropped it from my military system. We had a good enough time camping out there in the fields and woods, but one day we heard that the invader was approaching, so we had to pack up and move, of course, and within 24 hours he was coming again. So we moved again. Next day he was after us once more. Well, we didn't like it much, but we moved rather than make trouble. I later found out it was U.S. Grant and his men who were chasing us around like that a man I would come to know quite well under much different circumstances a couple of decades later. Anyway, this went on for a week or ten days more, and we saw considerable scenery. Then Ben Tupper lost patience. He said, War ain't what it's cracked up to be. I'm going home if I can't ever get a chance to sit down a minute. Why do these people keep us a-humping around so? Flame their skins, do they think this is an excursion? Some of the other town boys got to grumbling. They complained that there was an insufficiency of umbrellas. So I sent around to the farmers and borrowed what I could. Then they complained that the Worcester sauce was out. There was mutiny and dissatisfaction all around, and naturally here came the enemy pestering us again as much as two hours before breakfast, too. Well, nobody wanted to turn out, of course. This was a little too much. The whole command felt insulted. I detached one of my aides and sent him to the brigadier and asked him to assign us a district where there wasn't so much bother going on. The history of our campaign was laid before him, but instead of being touched by it, what did he do? He sent back an indignant message and said, You have had a dozen chances inside of two weeks to capture the enemy, and he is still at large. Well, we knew that. Stay where you are, or I will court-martial and hang the whole lot of you. Well, I submitted this brutal message to my battalion and asked their advice. The orderly sergeant said, If Tom Harris wants the enemy, let him come and get him. 
I ain't got any use for my share, and who's Tom Harris anyway? I'd like to know. It's putting on so many frills. Why, I knew him when he was nothing but a darn telegraph operator. Gentlemen, you can do as you choose, but as for me, I've had enough of this sashaying around so that you can't get a chance to pray because the time's all required for cussing. So off goes my war paint, you hear me. The whole regiment said with one voice, That's the talk for me. So there and then, on the spot, my brigade disbanded itself and tramped off home, with me at the tail of it. I hung up my own sword and returned to the arts of peace. And there were some people who said I hadn't been absent from them yet. We were the first men that went into the Confederate service in Missouri. We were the first that went out of it, anywhere. The philosophers among those assembled here tonight might reflect on the fact that it was not until after I discharged myself from my military obligations that the Confederacy fell. General Grant, who was not one given to paying compliments gratuitously, later said frankly that if I had conducted the whole war, much bloodshed would have been spared. My older brother Orion... Ten years older than me, the oldest of my siblings, had gone against the grain of most people in that part of Missouri and advocated for the abolition of slavery and unionism. In fact, he had tirelessly campaigned for Abraham Lincoln when that man was running for president. After Lincoln was elected to that office, my brother was rewarded for his efforts by his being appointed Secretary of the Nevada Territory a brand new territory which Lincoln wanted to become a state soon, a desire that would be fulfilled just three years later, in 1864. Orion had no money to get to his new situation in Nevada. I wanted to get away from the war, and I had money, saved from my wages as a pilot. So I bought the tickets for both of us, and we headed west together. First on a steamboat up the Missouri River to St. Joseph, and the rest of the way by stagecoach from St. Joe to Carson City. It took us 20 days to make that journey. Today it would only take a few days by train. During that long, bumpy ride, we saw Indians, desperados, jackrabbits, coyotes, lots of sagebrush and dust, and even the occasional Pony Express rider. We finally arrived in Carson City, the capital of the territory, travel-worn and covered with alkali dust. <laughs> 